Welcome to Senadiban Education Foundation again. Education is the ability to listen to almost anything without losing your temper or your self-confidence. Actually, we started this education program way back in 2007 by releasing our education program. It was released by Professor Antonio Longo, who is the founder of uh, Stepla Hemorrhoidectomy uh, from Italy. Then we launched Senadiban Education Foundation 2012, January, by uh, releasing a set of educational DVDs by Professor Sion Han Kim, a colorectal surgeon from Korea. Then we uh, used to have six months and one year free fellowship program, which are hands-on in basic and advanced laparoscopy surgeries with a uh, hands-on uh, experience. Uh, with the advent of COVID, we started the online programs and uh, our logo was inaugurated by Professor uh, Palani Velu. Then we started having live surgeries in our online platform. First, we did a Facebook live uh, lap LAR. Then we did a lap uh, Bipples, uh, which, uh, which was YouTube live. Then uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the lectures with the world leaders like Paul, Paul Sugarbaker started. Actually, we have uh, parents in uh, social media. We have almost 20 uh, WhatsApp groups. And uh, we have a Facebook uh, group, which is having almost uh, 1,200 uh, uh, participants or delegates. Actually, in the season one, we had a 28 webinars with the world le uh, leaders. Uh, we had a good uh, uh, participation from uh, more than 56 countries uh, at a time, uh, making it one of the largest virtual platforms in the world. We have a, a YouTube channel. Uh, all the webinar videos are available for free reference in the YouTube channel of uh, Senajo Education Foundation, which is having about uh, uh, nearly 3,000 uh, subscribers. Today we have with us Professor Paul Sugar Baker, who is a well-known figure worldwide, who is, the, who is known as the father of uh, IPAC, who designed and popularized Sugar Baker procedure by combining uh, cytorectal surgery with the uh, regional chemotherapy. He will be introduced formally by uh, one of our colleagues, and uh, the session will be moderated by uh, Dr. Jamakrishna, who is the professor of surgical oncology at the AR Cancer Institute, Chennai. Uh, for discussion, for active discussion, we have Professor Carl Egner from Germany. Professor Soma Shekhar, who is the chairman and HOD of Surgical Oncology, Manipal Comprehensive Cancer Center, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore, um, which is one of the highest volume centers of IPEC in Asia. And also, uh, uh, we have Dr. Ganesh, who is one of, uh, one of the pioneers in doing IPEC in India. And uh, we have Yogesh Kumar Vashist also from Germany, who is also doing regional chemo chemotherapy and uh, IPEC surgery in a large manner. And uh, the moderator and the speaker will be introduced by Prof. Uh, Dr. Bhavana Parik, uh, who is a surgical oncologist, Sterling Hospital, Ahmedabad. Before uh, giving the mic to Bhavana, uh, let me uh, tell you all, all the participants are requested to mute their mic on entry. If possible, kindly acknowledge by renaming your device by yours. Participants working from outside India are requested to reveal their identity in the chat box so that the host can acknowledge you. Raise your hand if you want to intervene and everybody will be given permission to raise your hand and discuss with the, uh, with the uh, professors and the panelists. Everybody will be given permission to unmute their mic. Please feel free to uh, have one-to-one -one interaction. If you are on a portable device, please mute your audio and hide your video. And uh, for contacting us, you can mail me at uh, senadipin at gmail.com. I, I am stopping sharing the video and giving the mic to Dr. Bhavana Parikh to introduce the moderator and the speaker as a custom. We have nearly 300 uh, participants now. Few will be joining <coughs> soon. Good evening, sir. Make it uh, uh, full screen. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone from India and happy Deepavali and happy new year from Gujarat. 
Thank you, Dr. Sena Deepan, sir, for giving me an opportunity to introduce one of the most eminent speaker of uh, uh, peritoneal surface malignancy surgeries, Dr. Paul A. Sugarbaker, and uh, our own moderator, Dr. A. S. Ramakrishnan, sir. Uh, thank you uh, for being a part of such a wonderful meeting and to be among with the all eminent speakers, uh, all, all eminent consultants today. Uh, to introduce first, uh, Dr. A. S. Ramakrishnan, sir, he's a surgical oncologist from ADR. Uh, he has done his MCH and DNB Surgical Oncology from Cancer Institute at Yale. He did his MBBS from Calicut Medical College. He did his MB MS DNB from Kipluk Medical College. He finished his MCH Surgical Oncology in 2005 from Cancer Institute at Yale. He was the organizing secretary for International Rectal Cancer Update, which was held in February 2012. He did his 12, 31 publications and 21 presentations in international conferences, and he has written two chapters for a book. Uh, I got an uh, opportunity to meet him uh, during a Bangalore cancer, uh, Bangalore HIPEC meeting uh, organized by Dr. Shom Shekhar, sir. So I met him personally at that time. Uh, he has an area of interest of cytoreductive surgery and HIPEC. Uh, he's interested in rectal cancer surgery and multidisciplinary management. He's been very much interested in non operative management of rectal cancers, clinical trials, and quality of cancer for the colorectal cancers. He has recently started doing a robotic onco surgery. So, welcome, Dr. H. Ramakrishnan, sir. You are a moderator for today's session. Uh, I'm extremely lucky and privileged to be part of this meeting as well as uh, to introduce Dr. Paul H. Sugarbaker. It is a one in a lifetime opportunity to introduce you, sir. So, good evening, Dr. Paul H. Sugarbaker, sir. Uh, he's a renowned, uh, world renowned cancer surgeon from the United States. He was chief of peritoneal surface malignancy program and the director of center for GI malignancy at the MedStar Washington Hospital Center in Washington, DC. Since 1989 to, till last year, he moved to Sugar Baker Oncology Associate, Washington, DC last year. Uh, he started in 1976. He began working at a surgery branch at the National Cancer Institute as a senior investigator and worked for a decade. After a short spell at the MO clinic at Atlanta, he moved to Washington Cancer Institute at the Medsa Washington Hospital Cancer uh, Center as a medical director in 1989. In 1993, Dr. Sugar Baker became a chief of peritoneal surface malignancy program at the Washington Cancer Center and a director for their cancer for the Center for the GI uh, Gastrointestinal Malignancies. Dr. The Sugar Baker is a very big name himself. He's a global leader in surgical oncology. He's a father of HIPEC. He credited his first, uh, he developed and he's been credited for doing a first cytodeductive surgery in HIPEC, mm -hmm. the Sugar Baker procedure in the world. The Sugar Baker name is a synonymous with the advancing treatment of the peritoneal cancer and mesothelioma. He did his first Sugar Baker procedure more than two decades ago. Though through the last three years, he traveled to all five continents to teach others. Uh, Dr. Sugar Baker still travels to Europe annually to teach course in peritoneal surface oncology. He's a tireless innovator and one of the legend of our time. He's a global leader in surgical oncology. This was a statement from Dr. Moran from UK. He thinks part of obligation as an innovator is to pass on what you learned and what you accomplished so the other can expand on it. So that is a very great thought from Dr. Sugar Baker, sir. He's author of for more than 900 scientific articles on the cancer treatment. He published more than 10 textbooks on surgery, oncology, and written book chapters as well. Majority of his research focus on peritoneal metastasis only. He edited many books and created more than two dozen videos. He lectures extensively, and he's on the editorial board of more than 11 medical journals. He's been awarded as a founding member of International Society of Regional Cancer Therapy. He's an editorial board on European Journal of Surgical Oncology, Distinguished Service Award for American Society of Abdominal Surgeons, Nurses' Choice Physician Collaboration Award, Washington Cancer Hospital Center, E.T. Kremser Award for Base Research Development, 8th International Conference of Regional Cancer Treatment. He's a follower of Royal College of Surgeons of England and Royal College of Surgeons in uh, surgeons of uh, Scotland. So, uh, I, uh, without wasting much of our time, I hand over to Dr. Paula Sugarbaker so he can start his lecture as early as possible. Thank you, Dr. Beju, sir, for giving me such a wonderful opportunity. Yeah. Uh, All right. Now, I request uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dhamma uh, to uh, 
take over the proceedings and then i will start the video of uh, professor sugar uh, uh, who has already sent my uh, sent the videos to me i will be playing from my side so damakrishnan please uh, uh, take over the proceedings thank you dr uh, baiju uh, it's uh, i think uh, a very difficult task to uh, compress uh, an entire lifetime of work of dr sugar baker into a few slides but i think dr bhavna has done a good job in doing that uh, I personally known Dr. Shubhendu Baker since 2014 when he came to Chennai for uh, our NATCOM meeting of the Indian Association of Surgical Oncology, and ever since I think uh, the, uh, the field of peripheral surface malignancy in India has taken off thanks to his uh, advice and uh, encouragement to all the surgeons in India. Uh, we are very lucky. It's not always that we get to interact with. Uh, a pioneer of a surgical technique and uh, a father figure of a branch of a specialist uh, branch of uh, oncology uh, this forum has uh, many international participants apart from participants from india we have people from pakistan slovenia nepal peru yemen colombia paraguay istanbul to name a few so i'm not going to come in between you and dr sugar baker uh, professor sugar baker may i request you to kindly uh, deliver your lecture um, Ram, thank you uh, so very much. And Dr. Ganesh, thank you for that kind uh, introduction. And I think that we should go ahead and uh, start that uh, video. While the uh, uh, video is uh, beginning to uh, uh, um, show us what we need to do, let me make a, a, a preliminary comment. Um, I'm going to talk about the the technology of, of uh, uh, peritoneal surface malignancy. The patient selection uh, is not going to be covered. All those important decisions that, that need to be made in terms of patient selection are, uh, are not going to be uh, covered. And uh, if, if, if you started to watch this because you're interested in minimally invasive surgery, well, I, I'll have to tell you, this is uh, maximally uh, invasive uh, surgery. Um, and then um, finally, I, I'm not going to say anything about HIPEC. I'm, go I'm going to uh, concentrate on, on the surgery that must proceed any uh, uh, installation of chemotherapy into the peritoneal space. Installations of, of chemotherapy into the peritoneal space with outsider reduction can only be palliative and, and directed at, at uh, 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 debilitating ascites. So I'm, I'm going to be focusing on step one in the management uh, the treatment. We're not going to actually basically be talking about prevention. We're going to be talking about treatment of peritoneal metastases. And we could go ahead and finish and, and get started into the uh, uh, video of five uh, peritoneectomy procedures. Thank you, Professor. I'll be starting from my side. Good. Presents five parietal peritoneectomy procedures. Now I could I could narrate it better probably uh, if we just turn down the uh, the audio. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I will do that. <laughs> okay, there we go. So these um, thirteen videos are available uh, on um, psogi.com. So if you want to go back and, and review uh, uh, certain aspects of the uh, video, um, go to, 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 to psogi.com. So uh, let me just clear my screen here a little bit. So. We're going to start off with uh, with the uh, anterior uh, parietal uh, uh, peritoneectomy. 
Is the video moving? Yeah, video is not at moving. While, while we get the uh, video, oh, we go. Okay, so um, I think it's very important. Um, the video is a little, I think, it'll, I think it'll square itself away here over time. Before you start the cider reduction, it's really important to set up your fixed retractor. And that fixed retractor, uh, we can uh, see the uh, uh, stitches here that, that hold the uh, edges of the abdominal wall up. And that allows us to begin this anterior parietal peritoneectomy. And I, I like these shots because I think they show something that's absolutely crucial. We are not cutting the tissues with uh, a scissor or a knife. We are using a extremely high voltage uh, uh, ball tip electrosurgery. Now, this is gonna cost you a few extra days in the hospital to use this uh, type of dissection. It's gonna cost you some additional uh, uh, serous drainage post-op, but uh, after we finish clearing up the edges of the abdominal incision, then of course, we're going to insert our fixed retractor. I, I happen to have always worked with the Thompson uh, self-retaining retractor, but of course, you can use a, a variety of uh, retractors. Buck is uh, good and and there's a number of them that's been used. Now, as you can see, this, this just follows the principles of good surgery. We, we have a traction, a, a counter traction, and um, um, we're water cooling and smoke evacuating as we uh, dissect. Um, this, this creates a lot of flume. And, and unfortunately, it, it's been outlawed in France uh, because of the amount of, of smoke that's uh, created. But that's, that's really not very smart uh, because the smoke can be completely controlled uh, with a, a smoke evacuator. And, and you can see that the, that the, the tissue transection is from a beam of electrodes. Now, I'm not going to have recurrences at the site of my peritoneectomies. If you're using scissor knife dissection and you're gonna have little holes in the peritoneum, you're gonna have recurrences, especially up under the diaphragms and the like. But uh, now this is, uh, look here at this uh, electrosurgical coagulator. We've put it into kind of a hockey stick configuration and we will bloodlessly will bloodlessly be able to remove all of the uh, tumor nodules from the uh, surface of the uh, liver so we started with the anterior the complete we started with the complete anterior parietal peritoneectomy and now in this appendiceal malignancy patient we're going to the left hemidiaphragm. And uh, I'm not in a hurry here. I'm not in a hurry. I'm going to try very hard to spare that anterior branch of the phrenic uh, artery and vein in order to maximize uh, the uh, blood supply to the, uh, to the uh, uh, diaphragm. And you can, as you get to the tenderness mid portion of the uh, uh, hemi diaphragms, th th there is a, 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 a laxity of the tissues. And you see that I can actually just pull those tissues away. And the, in, in this patient, the, the uh, uh, margin is completely clean and we're not going to have any recurrences. Now, right now, my surgical brain is beginning to think, right adrenal gland. 
Okay, we're way down uh, in uh, Morrison's pouch, and uh, we we we're placing. We've got good exposure. You can see that purple thing coming in. That's the smoke evacuator. We're we're uh, going to release the uh, uh, lateral ligaments here and completely remove the uh, peritoneum from the uh, uh, posterior aspect of the liver, the, the hepatorenal space. But be careful as you pull, as I am here, that you're not pulling the uh, adrenal apart. Oh, sorry, so this is important, this is important. Look at this carefully. You can see in the background there, the right, hepatic vein and under direct vision, under direct vision, I'm not gonna get into any trouble. I'm releasing, I'm releasing the peritoneal reflection from the posterior aspect of the liver. Under direct vision, everyone says, oh my gosh, how am I going to avoid uh, uh, trauma to the hepatic veins? Well. Actually, the hepatic vein that most people get is the left hepatic vein. And here we are in the um, posterior aspect uh, of the liver. There you can see in the background there, you can see the adrenal gland. See it right there? There it is right at the tip of my uh, ball tip uh, dissector. And I'm not going to traumatize that here. I'm releasing the peritoneal reflection just in front of the... Uh, caudate lobe veins. I'm not going to get into the caudate lobe veins. I, I have uh, a big abdominal incision. And here, Dr. Bajelic is my uh, assistant here. Dr. Bajelic now helping run the program in Barcelona. Um, and we're completely stripping this posterior uh, peritoneal layer. And again, so many people are having recurrences. Uh, posterior to the liver and it's due to now there's that there's that uh, uh, duodenum there remember the duodenum is a retroperitoneal structure and unless you're thinking duodenum as you do this uh, uh, dissection here you're you're going to uh, traumatize the duodenum so our most common fistula after cytoreductive surgery is the small bowel fistula. Second most common is, uh, is ureteral and third is pancreas. Major uh, 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 vascular structure that's damaged is the left hepatic vein. So here we're, we're just removing the, the uh, peritoneum and some, not all, and some of the, uh, okay, this is the specimen from the undersurface of the right hemidiaphragm. My dear gynecologic oncology colleagues would have, would have waved the CUSA dissector back in this area and, and removed some of the mucus, but they would not have this type of margin. This is a completely clean stripping of the uh, right subphrenic uh, space. And uh, of, of course, after we finish on the right, we're going to do a similar procedure on the left. Now, a lot of people say to me, oh my gosh, these people are going to be intubated for uh, many days afterwards. Their diaphragm muscle is going to be weak. These people are extubated two or three hours after surgery. This sort of a stripping, if it's done cleanly, if it's done without trauma, now sometimes there is trauma, especially in ovarian cancer and in recurrent ovarian, you almost always have to do, have to resect that central tendon of the uh, a diaphragm. But on a, on a primary patient like this with uh, a mucinous appendiceal malignancy, uh, we, we will uh, b basically, uh, 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 extubate them uh, within a couple of hours of the uh, surgery. Now, again, you can see the adrenal gland there uh, popping up uh, just underneath the uh, uh, left hemidiaphragm. Again, I'm going to use some, some finger dissection to, to somewhat clarify 
this uh, stripping of the undersurface of the uh, left hemidiaphragm. I'm, I'm looking very carefully to make sure that my margin, that my peritoneectomy margin is, uh, is good. There, there's a, I'm dissecting up the adrenal gland a little bit more perhaps than I usually do just to, to show it to you. It's right there. If you tear into it, I've done it. If you tear into it, very often you just have to remove it because uh, it's going to bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed uh, as a result of that blunt uh, trauma. So put a lap pad in there. So this is the undersurface of the uh, left hemidiaphragm, and we can see the pericardial uh, surface uh, there. And so we've completed three of the five uh, parietal peritoneectomy procedures. So now we're going to go to the one that's the most fun, to tell you the truth, and the one that is almost always complete, almost always complete. This is the, the pelvic peritoneectomy. Um, in this particular patient, we're doing a visceral sparing pelvic peritoneectomy. In other words, we're able, because the disease is uh, low grade and, and it's an early appendiceal neoplasm, we're going to be able to uh, preserve the rectosigmoid colon. Now, what I've done here, you can see on the right side, you can see that I've, I've, I've got the, the um, uh, ure, I've got the uh, uh, urecus, I've got the urecus in an Alice clamp and I'm, I'm placing traction on the ureter, uh, on the bladder. I'm being very careful with this bladder. I'm not pulling too hard on it. Bladder leaks uh, are, are much too common. Um, I can see the, the right ureter there plainly. It's been skeletonized. And I don't call the gynecologist in to do, to do the, the hysterectomy. I'm, I'm placing these sutures very carefully, very carefully, just uh, uh, superior uh, to the uh, right ureter. And I'll put one of them on uh, uh, distally and then on another one more proximally, and I'll, I'll not cut that second one. I'll just hold up on it. You can see it preserved uh, there, and and that that uh, um, stay on the uterine artery shows me exactly. See them right there, one on the right side, one on the left side. Shows me exactly where I'm going to go through to find the tissues there to find the. Uh, anterior vagina. Okay, so we're going to do a pelvic peritoneectomy, hysterectomy, and the upper vagina is coming out. We're going to leave the rectosigmoid colon behind on this particular patient, and I'll show you why. Not so often. This uh, is uh, uh, not, not uh, the standard. Usually, the rectosigmoid colon goes but, but here we're able to do a, a visceral sparing, a rectosigmoid colon sparing pelvic peritoneectomy. So here we're going uh, using this high voltage electrosurgery. You see, there's no bleeding. Th this, this high voltage electrosurgery uh, not only cuts, but it also coagulates. And so I'm grabbing the posterior aspect there of the vagina. Uh, with an Alice clamp, and now I'm I'm dissecting the peritoneum away from the anterior aspect of the uh, rectum, and this is basically now a cul-de-sacectomy. We're we're performing a cul-de-sacectomy. <laughs> um, See the ureters there, the uh, common iliac artery and vein. And, and here, I don't know whether you see my pointer or not, probably you don't. 
but you can see the anterior rectum there, lots of tumor in this cul-de-sac here, but the, as soon as you get rid of the cul-de-sac, it's not necessary uh, to remove the rectum in all of these patients. And, and um, we're, we're gonna be using a fair amount. There's a big squirt of uh, room temperature water. We're gonna, be, we're gonna be watching that we don't use too much heat. Another big squirt of room temperature water. And, and here we have the, the uh, rectum beneath the cul-de-sac, uh, totally skeletonized. There will be no recurrence there. There's the cervix and, and, and uh, um, lots of disease in the rectal vesicle space. Lots of disease in the uh, uh, lots of disease in in the uh, utero vesicle space. Lots of disease in the um, uh, utero rectal space, the uh, cul-de-sac, and um, we'll we'll not close the vagina yet because, of course, we have to close the vagina to do the hypac. But we'll wait until we've done all the dissections. Then we'll wash. We'll do a dilute peroxide wash, and then we'll do 10 liters of saline. And then and only then will, will we close the vagina. Because when I was doing this close technique, I had too many recurrences, too many recurrences at the low anastomosis and at the apex of the vagina. So now we're gonna, we're gonna as a preliminary to stripping the crust, of the right hemidiaphragm, which is gonna be uh, heavily loaded by uh, uh, a tumor. We're, we're doing a cholecystectomy. And I would recommend to you a cholecystectomy uh, as part of this procedure. I, I've had to go back and remove the gallbladder uh, for stones, usually two or three or four or five years later for stones. And so I re recommend uh, uh, so I recommend removing the gallbladder. So in the lower aspect here is the stomach. And then I'm using, and, and the blood supply, that, that beautiful collateral uh, uh, vessel going between right and left gastric arteries. I'm using a profound digital dissection to move the tumor off of the lesser curvature of the stomach this is the peritoneal reflection on the undersurface of the uh, left lobe of the liver. We're gonna see the ductus, uh, the, the, the uh, um, ductus venosus or the remnant of the uh, ductus uh, venosus um, in the uh, fissure uh, that's uh, defined by that structure. Be careful, don't pull too hard on it and pull the uh, left hepatic vein down into the uh, dissection, releasing the peritoneal reflection of the hepatoduodenal ligament. And, and then this is a, a very loose peritoneum here in this patient who's having her first operation. It's a rather loose peritoneal structure and we're always worried about these structures in the porta hepatis. But, but we, can, we can release the peritoneal reflection and then just very nicely pull the little tumor nodules and the mucousy peritoneum uh, away from the uh, portal structures and perform a complete stripping of the uh, anterior uh, hepatoduodenal ligament. Now we're beginning to, to worry about the posterior aspect. Hello? Of the, that was the right that that's the right gastric artery there I picked up on it and and uh, um, very careful with it I really like to preserve that arcade made up by the right and left uh, gastric uh, arteries the stomach does better if you can you, you're, you're going to lose the anterior vagus as you as you do the lesser omentectomy it's nice to leave those vessels intact now I'm kind of going around behind the portal structures and I'm gonna make sure that there's no disease left down there in uh, the foramen of Winslow. Now, if there's a lot of disease in the foramen of Winslow, then you've got to attack this from the other side. You've got to do a, 
a, an extensive coker maneuver, an extensive coker maneuver and roll the duodenum from, uh, from right to left and clean out that posterior has aspect of the hepatoduodenal ligament. Don't need to do it on this patient. We're just able to strip away uh, <clears throat> the, the contents of the uh, foramen of Winslow and uh, uh, just a big, big uh, a lymphatic there uh, that we're uh, dividing. And you can have quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of serous drainage on these uh, patients. And so I leave their closed suction drains in for uh, about four days, sometimes five or six, if they're having the early postoperative intraperitoneal chemotherapy. So yeah, there's some tumor on the surface of the caudate lobe of the liver. <coughs> As always on the liver, we just electro evaporate the, uh, the tissues. So that's first layer of the omental bursectomy. Now we're gonna divide the peritoneal reflection between the vena cava and the crust of the right hemidiaphragm. There's a lot of mucousy peritoneum and some tumor down here. So just to the, just to the uh, uh, left is the vena cava and, and uh, Lana Bajelic's doing a very nice job of gently moving those uh, uh, hepatic structures from left to right. So I can see clearly, I can see clearly that peritoneal reflection on the uh, vena cava. The ball tip is perfect for this. You can go just as deep as you want and no deeper. And I'm, then I'm getting a hold of this peritoneum similar to what we did on the uh, uh, hepatoduodenal ligament. I'm just pulling all those, that mucousy peritoneum away, few tumor nodules. I can see under direct vision, the left hepatic vein, the, the most common major bleed, most common major bleed with cytoreductive surgery is in this maneuver and people don't see clearly the left hepatic vein and, and either they pull down on the uh, ligamentum venosum which can, be, which can be partially open and um, they, they can get a major Dr. Shugubega, I think you have muted yourself. Uh, your voice is not hearing. Uh, can you please unmute? I don't know who. How's this? Yeah, yeah. Now yes, it's okay. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Uh, strange things happen with these international uh, connections. Uh, so this is the lesser omentum. It's being taken off of the uh, lesser curvature of the stomach. Uh, we, we basically always uh, uh, try to preserve the, the uh, arcade of the right and left gastric artery, but we almost always uh, take the anterior vagus nerve. And as you can see, this is the specimen. You're, you're not going to get this tumor out from underneath that left the lateral segment of the liver and, and in the uh, gastrohepatic ligament, unless you do this cholecystectomy, lesser omentectomy, and then stripping of the omental bursa. The omental bursa is basically the peritoneum over the anterior aspect of the crust of the right hemidiaphragm. So we've completed these five peritoneectomy procedures. And at this point, we'll wash uh, extremely uh, thoroughly. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, but whenever we finish a, a peritoneectomy, we put laparotomy pads down in the uh, uh, base uh, so that tumor cells don't fall down in. So here we're moving. Now to some, some uh, I think, important uh, uh, aspects of the visceral dissections. So we've, we've, we've focused uh, 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 to this point in time on uh, 
the parietal peritoneectomy procedures. Now let's focus on some of the, the, the more tricky, the more tricky aspects of visceral uh, cytoreduction. reduction. And I call this checklist for optimal cytoreduction. reduction. I could say checklist from, for, for optimal visceral cytoreduction. reduction. So we've just completed the uh, um, peritoneectomy procedures. I didn't show the mesenteric peritoneectomy, which is frequently necessary, uh, uh, especially with, with a peritoneal mesothelioma. Mesenteric peritoneectomy may be necessary for, mes for, for peritoneal mesothelioma. All these others are, of course, uh, but I, I didn't show that. It's almost kind of an entity of itself, how to clear the small bowel mesentery and then how to clear the large bowel mesentery and preserve the uh, viscera uh, when you've got advanced um, peritoneal mesothelioma. So we're going to talk about some of the visceral resections now and some of the special requirements for performing a, a complete visceral resection. Next slide, please. Uh, I went through this, the importance of the skin traction sutures. Um, you know, it, it's amazing to me, I, I just finished a review of uh, almost 300 patients who had had um, cytoreductive surgery in HIPEC for colon cancer. And when we dissected out laparoscopy port sites in the old abdominal incision, just under 50% had disease within the old abdominal incision or laparoscopy port sites. I think that these, that, that you need to, to, to use these skin traction sutures to elevate uh, that uh, uh, um, old abdominal incision. Um, it's nice to stay right in the linea alba or just at the, the, the sides of the scar. It's nice to have the, the, the uh, um, abdominal wall being pulled up away from the small bowel loops. I always construct this peritoneal window, put my finger in, decide whether I need to or don't need to do the anterior parietal peritoneectomy. And if we do, the skin traction sutures allow uh, the initial five to 10 centimeters of the anterior parietal peritoneectomy to proceed. And then of course, for me, virtually all these patients are gonna get some type of, uh, of mechanical cleansing mechanical cleansing of their peritoneal space, and then they're going to get a high pec. And um, most of them are going to be, at least all the gynecologic oncology patients, are going to be set up for early postoperative intraperitoneal paclitaxel. Next slide. So here's skin traction sutures. You can see that I had to set up I had to set up the Thompson retractor before I made the abdominal incision. Most people don't do that, but you should. Set up your, your self-retaining retractor, your fixed retractor before you make that abdominal incision. Next. So here the abdomen is uh, open. And as you can see, we, we have a, a, a nice view of of what we need to do over the next uh, eight to uh, 10 hours. So, uh, so that's the question. What's the most common fistula after cytoreductive surgery and hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy? I might say much more common in reoperative surgery. Most common fistula is small bowel fistula. Second most common fistula, next slide, is the fistula to the ureter. And I only show this slide to tell you that if you're going to start looking for the ureter down here in a reoperative pelvis, you're a surgical fool. 
Don't look for the ureter down in this pelvic region. Find the ureter up in the uh, abdomen and a nice, uh, uh, unex uh, a nice uh, previously undissected area and then trace it on down. And don't feel that you're uh, uh, not sufficiently courageous. You're not sufficiently courageous as a surgeon if you use uh, ureteral uh, stents. Um, towards the latter part of my career, uh, I use stents uh, in all the reoperative cases. And I think it did uh, uh, dramatically uh, help in, in uh, minimizing the trauma in that heavily surgerized, the older I got, the more cases I had that, that, that had two or three prior surgeries. And that, uh, that poor pelvis is, is sometimes uh, just a, a massive scar. And uh, finding the ureter high in the abdomen, tracing it down uh, uh, if necessary with a ureteral stent uh, and, and uh, minimizing, you're gonna have some, minimizing the, the uh, damage to the ureter. And then if you do have de delayed leakage, be, be ready to, to do the rendezvous procedure. Next slide. So we saw this in the uh, previous uh, uh, video a little bit, but um, be very careful of your, your bladder. When you do the lower abdominal and pelvic dissection, find the urachus. We have the search for you, the urachus. After the search for the urachus, you put a clamp on it and elevate the bladder, put the bladder on, next slide, put the bladder on traction, next. See here, the, the, the urachus is, is pulled up, the bladder is on traction. This is a beautiful plane in here, beautiful plane. And, and all of this, this heavily uh, 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 involved uh, peritoneum uh, posterior to the bladder and on top of the uterus are on top of the uh, uh, rectal sigmoid in a male can can really be stripped away without any damage to the uh, to the bladder at all. Next slide. So once you dissect out the anterior aspect of the vagina and transect it anteriorly. Put an Alice clamp on the posterior aspect of the peritoneum to see whether you can perform a, a visceral sparing pelvic peritoneectomy. Next slide. And here you can see the Alice clamp. It's on the posterior aspect of the uh, uh, vagina. I'm going to pull up on it. And all of these tissues here that uh, make up the uh, cul-de-sac are gonna be stripped away from the anterior rectum without any trauma to the ureters on either side, without any trauma to the anterior aspect of the rectum. And in a certain number of patients, we'll be able to do a visceral sparing pelvic peritoneectomy. But, but having this I'm sort of exposure that. and traction on the uh, posterior vagina is a big help. Next slide. So most people don't realize that there are subphrenic planes. Now it can be that the post, the, the subphrenic plane is totally obliterated by invasive tumor. Very often the case with ovarian malignancy and then you're not going to be able to bluntly strip. But uh, as uh, in the patient that we presented with, with uh, uh, um, a appendiceal neoplasm, next slide, we can bluntly dissect the right subphrenic plane starting medially. There is this uh, anterior lateral branch, branch of the inferior phrenic vessels. You can get your uh, index finger in there and and, and start the uh, dissection and, and, and really minimally, minimally traumatize that uh, 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 right 
uh, diaphragm. Next slide. <clears throat> See, it's right there. I can put my finger right into that uh, uh, subphrenic plane. Goes right along the um, left, right, excuse me, right along the right hepatic vein. Next slide. Now, when you go laterally, don't stop your dissection until you get to the tip of the 12th rib and you can feel this lateral arcuate ligament. You need to get beneath the tissues that are lateral to the uh, um, uh, kidney, high up in the abdomen there, you're going to take the uh, uh, garotis fascia, the fatty tissues that surround the liver, you're going to take that with the dissection, and you're going to develop this right subphrenic plane from posteriorly. So you've developed it from the front, now you're going to develop it from the posterior. Next slide. And we're going to come together uh, uh, anterior to posterior and have a completely clean uh, um, a diaphragm. This is this lateral arcuate ligament here, which uh, as soon as you release the uh, peritoneum from this, uh, this lateral arcuate ligament, you can get your whole hand in underneath and this whole posterior aspect of the bladder uh, of the diaphragm can usually be be uh, dissected uh, bluntly because there's not not going to be a heavy tumor back there it's dissected bluntly up towards the area which is most likely to contain residual tumor which are these uh, central tendons of the diaphragm next On the left, the medial aspect of the left subphrenic vein does not develop as well as on the right. By dividing the perirenal fascia, the lateral aspect of the left subphrenic vein can be used effectively. Next slide. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, there's about a dozen people that developed obstruction of their left hepatic duct. Oh, five, maybe even seven years after uh, their uh, um, cytoreduction and went on to die of uh, involvement of the uh, porta hepatis. Because I didn't know early on about the hepatic bridge or you can call it the pont hepatique. The peritoneal tunnel around the hepatic round ligament must be divided to clear peritoneal metastases from beneath the hepatic bridge. Next slide. So this is a mesothelioma patient. Um, if we look carefully, I hope you can see, if you look carefully out this round ligament, you can see here, I don't know, can you see my pointer? No, you, are you talking no, about- you can't see my pointer, but you're pointing it out. You're yeah, pointing I, it out, mm -hmm. you're seeing, yeah, there's a nodule there and there's all nodules there. What about the, the uh, round ligament going down into the uh, liver itself? This is the, the um, uh, uh, um, segment three of the liver really wrapping around the, the uh, round ligament. And if you don't take that, you're going to get a recurrence. You don't expect your chemotherapy to get down in there with those nodules. Next slide. This is a class two. Uh, um, Pont hepatique, you can see these nodules of mesothelioma down underneath the, the pont hepatique. Those are going to recur. And the, the first sign of recurrence is obstruction of the uh, 
left uh, uh, hepatic duct. And unfortunately, uh, um, uh, that, has, uh, that has occurred with me, it hasn't occurred in the last decade, but uh, it happened to a number of patients uh, uh, early on. Now, be careful when you divide this round ligament this deep into the liver, you, you need to suture it off because the, the, the uh, um, uh, obliterated vessel there, the obliterated umbilical vein will be open and you'll get a major bleed unless you suture that off way down deep in the liver. So uh, some of these uh, hepatic bridges will be uh, two or three centimeters thick. Some of them will be uh, easy like this one. Some of them, there won't be anything there at all. We've described in a, a manuscript the uh, uh, three different types of a hepatic bridge. Next. So um, what about this gastrohepatic ligament? You know, uh, separating the men from the boys and the girls from the women is, is really... Oh. Is that, is that too sexist? Somebody objecting to uh, my... Uh, so we want to completely divide the left triangular ligament and left coronary ligament to mobilize, totally mobilize, the left lateral segment of the liver and elevate it from uh, right to left. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is the uh, gastrohepatic ligament or lesser omentum. We're gonna, we're gonna perform a cholecystectomy. We're gonna divide the peritoneum here along the arcade made up by the uh, right and left gastric arteries. And we're going to divide the uh, peritoneal reflection between liver and uh, gastrohepatic ligament. Next. Use profound, digi this is a Bill Heald's term, digital dissection. Use profound digital dissection to clear fat and tumor within the lesser omentum from the, the, the omental vascular arcade. Now, for years, I, I was, I was uh, um, very much afraid that I was going to have recurrences in and along the lesser curvature with this profound digital dissection, because if you don't know how to do that, you're going to be uh, performing on pseudomyxomas and, and uh, uh, on some of the low-grade uh, uh, um, uh, um, colon cancer patients, colon cancer patients with negative lymph nodes, you're gonna be performing antrectomies or total gastrectomies on a huge number of patients. You don't need to do that. Force the, the fatty tissue and the tumor off of this vascular arcade, preserve the right and left gastric arteries, forget about the anterior vagus nerve, you don't need it at all. Forget about it. You don't need to do a pyloroplasty. Uh, uh, just preserve those vessels. Next slide. <clears throat> and this shows, I'll be very patient here. I'll sometimes spend 15 or 20 minutes just forcing this, the tumor and, and fatty tissues away from this uh, beautiful a uh, uh, collateral between right and left gastric arteries because I'd love to see this distal portion of the stomach nice and pink. Now, by the way, if I screw up and I lose the uh, vascular tuture, vascular tuture to the distal stomach, I don't do a gastrectomy. That stomach can be totally blue when you leave and you're not gonna get a gastric perforation. So, but if you want the patient to open up nice and quickly, get rid of that disease and the lesser omentum by this digital dissection. Next slide. Oh, the go, here's the ligamentum venosum. So the ligamentum venosum is actually attached to the, uh, I can't, you can't see my, I'm sorry, you can't see my, this is C maybe, maybe, uh, uh, Dr. Sandipian, you can point out the uh, uh, left uh, hepatic vein there. A little higher, a little higher. That's caudate lobe there. And there's a, there's a, uh, 
there's a, uh, a silk here around the uh, uh, ligamentum venosum. This is the, the, the fissure defined by the ligamentum venosum. If you pull too hard on that, you're going to have a hole in the uh, left uh, hepatic vein. Sometimes you need to tie it off uh, because it will, it will remain open. The ligamentum venosum. Look for it next time you do. Yeah, th that, that is uh, the crust of the right hemidiaphragm. You have your pointer on now. And, and just a centimeter to the right, just a centimeter to the right, to the other direction, is the uh, left. There it is. There's a left hepatic vein right there, just sitting right there. And, and this uh, uh, ligamentum venosum goes right into it. And of course, that's, that's the way the, uh, the, the blood is shunted around the liver uh, in, the, uh, uh, in utero. Doesn't always close up completely. Next slide. <clears throat> and uh, this is going to be hard to show without my pointer, but here actually we've, we've uh, uh, done a left hepatectomy, and, and here is the uh, ligamentum venosum that's been, uh, that's been stapled off. Next slide. Now, big question, how to avoid prolonged gastric stasis? It does occur. I don't have any uh, profound uh, uh, physiological information to give you about this. I can, I can tell you what I do. After an extensive omentectomy, hopefully you've still got good blood supply, but that anterior vagus nerve, and very often, if you've got any accessory um, uh, right or left hepatic uh, arteries, especially accessory uh, left hepatic, um, uh, it's all gonna be cleaned out in there. How do you know when to perform a pyloroplasty? Because I've had to go back on a few occasions and do pyloroplasties. Actually, now we don't go back. I've, I've had patients, uh, uh, dilated, had the, the pylorus dilated, and that seems to work okay, but how can you present that? Next slide. Well, here's my simple way of, of doing it. Some people have a very tight um, pylorus. Uh, this patient, uh, it's nice and loose. I, I can pass my thumb and index finger uh, through the uh, pylorus. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything, no, no a pyloroplasty on this patient. If, and sometimes it seems to be the, the big, uh, very muscular male patient, I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but they seem to have a very thick uh, pylorus. And on those patients, I would do a, uh, I would do a pyloroplasty. Next slide. So we're coming to the end here. It's amazing, but the first question my patients ask me when they're awakening from their anesthesia and I'm going over to talk to them, hopefully with a family member as to what, what went on during the cytoreduction reduction and how successful were we and what did we have to remove? They don't ask, Dr. Sugarbaker, did you get all the cancer out or not? They ask, Dr. Sugarbaker, did you need to do an ostomy? And uh, I... I only do an ostomy on about 5% of patients. And that's even though uh, these on 5% of the patients who have a low anterior resection. And that's the ones usually that, that, that have uh, a, a reoperation. Uh, um, so so how, do you, how do you do a safe low anterior resection with HIPEC? And for me, that's very often with <laughs> EPIC and, and not do an ileostomy. Well, we try and preserve a long rectal stump and we do a two-layer anastomosis. First, a circular stapled colorectal anastomosis, and then we reinforce that circumferentially with sutures placed about every three millimeters apart. Next slide. <clears throat> So this shows uh, the, the uh, mid-rectum 
the mid rectum being preserved as much as possible. You can see that the middle rectal artery has been ligated there. Uh, try not to traumatize it too, too much. But we've got at least five centimeters of just rectum. So the rectum is like the esophagus. It has a beautiful longitudinal blood supply. Next slide. So we're going to do a standard circular stapled anastomosis with one big exception. We're going to take the lateral aspects of this rectal staple line and we're going to turn them in, going to turn them in so that <coughs> they are excised as part of the um, uh, donuts are circular tissue rings that are being removed from the rectum and from the uh, proximal uh, descending uh, colon. So you have this, this, this suture that just pulls it together. Next slide. This, this shows how, how, what, what you're doing is very simple. You just have a, a circular, I, I usually use a uh, uh, some sort of maxon or absorbable suture. So when when I when I close the uh, anastomot the circular anastomotic device, um, uh, the, the the lateral aspects are the ears. The ears of of the uh, rectal staple line are included. Next. So after that anastomosis is made. Oh, notice that uh, uh, here, uh, the vagina, I didn't cut the sutures on the closed vagina. I pulled up on those sutures to, to give me the best exposure. And so now about every three millimeters, I'm going to place a, a silk suture or whatever suture you want to use. I'll use silk, a silk suture to place a second layer of uh, closure on this colorectal uh, anastomosis. And... Um, if this goes well, I will not use a diverting ostomy. Now, uh, the Basingstoke group uh, uh, cursed me because they always put in a, a uh, um, diverting ostomy on these patients. Uh, they're coming around. Uh, and I think that now they're seldom, if they can put in a nice, neat, circular, circumferentially now, not just in the front, you need a, a nice redundant, redundant colon so you can get posterior and place the sutures posterior. But I don't think you need to perform an ostomy in most of these cytoreduction patients. Next. <clears throat> and this just shows these uh, sutures are going in. And I'll, I usually do this myself. I don't have the house staff do this. Put those sutures in nice, nice, uh, uh, generous uh, sutures through the uh, 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 rectum and, and then up uh, through the uh, uh, colon. Tie them, uh, I put the, all the sutures in anteriorly and then tie them up and then put all the sutures in posteriorly and tie them up. Like to do it really nice and neatly. Next. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like when you're done. Notice I haven't cut the sutures yet on the, uh, the vagina. I'm still holding up on, on that to... Uh, uh, give myself uh, exposure. Next. <clears throat> so what about the small bowel? You know, I don't use laparoscopy so much because I'm not so afraid of the small bowel. I, I usually can clear it. And if I do get a CC1 rather than a CC0 cytoreduction, you know, my survival is... Uh, uh, 18 months after a CC1 cytoreduction, reduction, if you don't do anything at all, the patient's gone in six months. And, and so I, I, I'm a great believer in this Mayo scissor dissection to clear the small bowel and its, min and its mesentery, of certainly of minimally invasive tumor. Next. And this is what we're doing. It's a little bit of an art form curved mayo scissor, you put it in at the right spot, you kind of pull up on it, and you take just the peritoneum and nothing else. Now, if you go too deep, you have to do a little repair, a seromuscular repair. But I can spend sometimes three or four hours 
That's the whole time during the open high pack and then maybe an hour or two before or after to make sure that, that the small bowel and its mesentery is absolutely as clean as possible. Next. <clears throat> and here, this is a mesothelioma <coughs> patient. Uh, this looks like a, a rather dramatic and, and hopeless situation. Next. We're able to clean this up absolutely completely. We didn't actually need to use the mesenteric peritoneectomy. We just used the, the uh, curved Mayo, Mayo scissor dissection. Next. So coming to the end here, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in HIPEC, especially if you think you've got free cancer cells and they can re-implant and you can get tumor cell entrapment. <clears throat> but um, I'm a great believer in the mechanical cleansing of the uh, abdomen. So whenever you complete a dissection, you put lap pads down in that area. And we, we do a, a large volume irrigation frequently, about every hour uh, during, between each uh, peritoneectomy, we'll do a very generous irrigation. And then, Following um, uh, uh, the complete cytoreduction, reduction, we do a irrigation with a, a 0 0.25, a dilute peroxide solution, six liters, uh, a lot of mechanical cleansing. Some people like to lose, use a, a dilute betadine solution. I can't do that at my hospital. We can't use betadine internally at all. So I use this... Uh, a very dilute peroxide, which gets rid of all of the blood clots. You will have no blood clots left anywhere after this, because those blood clots contain uh, cancer cells. Next slide. Uh, that is the uh, last slide. And if we, we have some way to, uh, to, to do some questions, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I always like the questions cause that's, that's where I learn. Yeah, actually, uh, we are all sitting wonderstruck seeing your amazing videos and, uh, excellent, uh, uh, slides. Actually, not only you are a, a brilliant surgeon, but also you are a, a good teacher who can teach the every aspect, minor aspect of the surgery. Uh, we are really, really, really honored to have you in this forum, uh, Professor Paul Shukabeka. Now I hand over the mic to Dr. Ramakrishnan to uh, conduct the proceedings. Thank you, Dr. Baiju, and thank you, Dr. Shukabeka, once again for a very wonderful lecture. Uh, your meticulous uh, steps uh, during uh, surgery clearly reflects uh, the kind of results uh, that you have. Uh, to start off with, uh, let me just ask you one question. I, I've often heard you say that what the surgeon does not see is what kills the patient after a cytoreductive surgery. So for the benefit of all those who are listening to you here, could you please uh, tell us which are the spots that one must really concentrate on and make sure that the disease is completely removed from these areas? Otherwise, uh, they are prone for recurrences. Yes, I know. I, I, I'm. Uh, that's somewhat of a thesis that I've uh, carried along uh, for uh, several decades. It's what the surgeon doesn't see that kills the patient. And when you're dealing with peritoneal metastases, there's there's no doubt that that is true. Now, HIPEC has come under uh, some some criticism. Uh, and, and I think that, that it's possible that, that we extended HIPEC into clinical situations that it, it really wasn't meant for. It, it's the, the HIPEC can, can and, and mechanical cleansing, I'm, I'm, I can I use those both together. They can, they can definitely eradicate, I think definitely they can eradicate free cancer cells. Those cells that that you that you 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 release into the peritoneal space. 
as, as part of the surgical trauma, uh, say, especially of, of removing a, uh, a gastric cancer that didn't respond to uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, the, the likelihood of, of the surgeon, uh, the likelihood of that patient going into the operating room with a contained malignancy and coming out with disseminated disease is, is very high. And, and the surgeon didn't know that he spilled those cancer cells. He, 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 didn't, he didn't see that. There's no way for us to see it, but it occurs. Um, Ram, I, when I look at my colon cancer patients with peritoneal metastases, of course, I'm operating on them after they've had a prior procedure, right? I'm re -up. You know, half of those patients, they had a completely adequate primary colon cancer resection. Half of my, my patients, the surgeon didn't see anything as he did that primary uh, colon uh, cancer resection. I'm not talking about rectal cancer now. We're, we're, it's a whole different situation. But the surgeon didn't see anything when he did that resection. And yet that patient is coming to me. Half of my patients uh, uh, had a totally clean uh, soul satisfying uh, right or left colon resection, and yet they've come down with peritoneal metastases. So in those particular instances, there's no doubt it's what the surgeon didn't see that's going to kill that patient, or at least get him referred to Paul Sugarbaker. Thank you. Uh, there are quite a lot of questions from the participants, but before that, uh, can I just request Dr. Ganesh and Dr. Somshaker to uh, give their comment and uh, start of the proceedings. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Ram. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ram. Uh, Professor Sugarbaker, fantastic talk as it is. You know, uh, one hour is too less for you. Uh, people need to attend your SO course, which you do for over two, three days. Uh, I know you're a great uh, SP, I agree with you. That's, a, that's That course is run by, by, uh, by uh, Beata Rao. And uh, we are going to try and have it uh, this March uh, in person. I hope we'll be able to, but it, it is, uh, it is a, a real great experience, especially if you're, if you're starting out uh, in, in, uh, in this business. Absolutely. And there's a lot of new starts, aren't there? A lot yeah. of people just starting up, yeah. Absolutely. And I know you're a great proponent of uh, HIPEC with uh, EPIC. Uh, can you throw some light? Because we try to replicate uh, your catheter-based normothermic uh, chemo after a HIPEC. Uh, somehow the toxicity profile in Indian patient was different, uh, but the results is amazing what you showed in with IPEC, you put Excel on day two, three, and four. Uh, could you uh, sort of enumerate that for the benefit of all the people who are logged in? Yeah. Um, SP, you know, you, you know that, that uh, your Indian patients are at least the Indian patients that I, I take care of in the US are um, more likely to develop um, chemotherapy related complications, especially neutropenia, than uh, are um, uh, most patients. Um, I don't know why that is, but, but I think if, if you do the EPIC, especially with, with uh, uh, five fluorouracil. Number one, it's very demanding for your nurses. Um, you know, you're now taking uh, uh, chemotherapy administration away from the oncology infusion center, and that's hard enough, and you're putting it in the operating room, and that makes your, your hospital administrators uneasy, and then you're putting it into the surgical intensive care unit and, and then onto the nursing unit, that, that takes a, a huge amount of, of institutional cooperation. And very few people have been able to, to uh, uh, perform the EPIC um, on a regular basis. So the EPIC that I'm most comfortable with is what's used in gastric cancer patients, mesothelioma patients, and uh, certainly uh, ovarian cancer patients, and, and that is paclitaxel, 20 to 40 milligrams uh, uh, per meter squared, 
and we give it five days in a row, and it's given in a dextran solution. Okay, it's given in a dextran solution, and that minimizes the adhesive process that's going to go on. Dextran uh, uh, placed into the peritoneal space is uh, uh, been shown in trials to decrease the amount of, of uh, uh, scar tissue, the, the, the small bowel adhesions. So um, what, what, what I uh, most strongly recommend is for the gastrics and, and the mesotheliomas and, and the, the uh, uh, ovarian malignancies, this uh, getting, getting them started on, on early postoperative intraperitoneal paclitaxel. And I, I, could, you know, I can go ahead and talk about this pharmacology stuff, but we like to use it five days in a row because uh, we, we know that we can peel the onion. With five days in a row, we can begin to actually take larger tumor cells and soften them up and have the, the paclitaxel penetrate deeply. If you give it all at once, you don't get that same peel the onion effect and the softening of the uh, tumor uh, nodule. So I'm, I'm very, very interested now. I don't want to get too far afield. We also are, are using uh, early postoperative intraperitoneal um, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. We're, we're putting nanoparticles into the peritoneal space. It's, it's a drug called doxel very good for ovarian cancer and for uh, endometrial cancer. And I think, that, I think that probably one of our more important drugs over the course of ne the next uh, five or so years is going to be uh, uh, in gynecologic malignancy. And, and it's going to be with paclitaxel and with uh, uh, doxel. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sugubaker. Uh, I have nearly 20 questions. Uh, Waiting. I'll try and uh, I'll try and go quickly here, Ram. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, before, uh, Dr. Ganesh. Would you like to say something? Yeah, I think I won't take much time, Ram. Wonderful presentation by Dr. Sugar Baker. I can just say that uh, one requires excellent anatomical understanding around the liver, if I am correct, to do those uh, procedures. Uh, what Dr. Sugar Baker was highlighting, especially around the gastrohepatic ligament, around the round ligament and then ligamentum venosum. I, I think that's the key for achieving good cytoreduction. Yes. And second, I also would uh, sort of, uh, sort of gay, uh, grasp from what Dr. Sugarbaker was telling about his views on long-term intraperitoneal euthermic uh, therapy. He was talking before the talk. Uh, I think uh, HIPEC is something, he lays a lot of emphasis on surgical aspects of CRS and HIPEC and other things follow it. I would just say these two things. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Ganesh, Carl, let Dr. me say thank you. Let me th th thank you for your comments. You, I think you're absolutely right that it's the area in and around the liver that can cause the most problems. And even today, it is probably the most common site for a recurrence. And and this this example of the of the uh, hepatic bridge, I think is, is a good one. And, and a lot of people don't clean out the, the foramen of Winslow, you know, and then they get a recurrence there in the port of hepatis and they wonder why. Well, they, they, didn't, they didn't do that coker maneuver and, and flip the duodenum over and, and, and clean out the foramen of Winslow. So I, I totally agree with your emphasis on the liver. Uh, as uh, are the areas the at anatomy in and around the liver is being absolutely uh, uh, crucial to a, uh, a good result. We're working hard on the long-term intraperitoneal chemo. You know, in my own experience, all my long-term survivors with, uh, with ovarian cancer, the ones that lived 10 years, they all got regional uh, in long-term intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Yeah, the, the, they did okay with uh, the with the systemic drugs, uh, but if the long term survivors, virtually all of them, uh, in my experience, got the long term intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy. I can actually say the same is true with the gastric cancers also. Thank you, uh, uh, Ramakrishna. You can go to Professor Egner and come back. Yeah, yeah, uh, Dr. Yogesh, uh, Professor uh, Egner, would you like to add a comment? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, come on. Right. 
Yes, I would like to talk about uh, your opinion, Paul, your opinion about uh, the isolated abdominal perfusion that I presented in, in the Phoenix meeting, because uh, we have a deep penetration of chemotherapeutics the, through the arterial route. And uh, my new colleague, Dr. Vajist, who is my deputy here, and the next chief of our hospital, uh, he made quite some experience. What do you think about it? Yeah, Mr. Schumerbeger, excellent talk. And uh, uh, I wanted to just have your opinion on two issues. You have shown uh, the entire operative procedure, but what case do you take your hands off? What are the limits? Obviously, the limits for you are different as for people like us or uh, from the 400 among us who are listening right now. And the second one is, if you have decided that patient is, cannot be resected, uh, what is your take on that? I mean, is PIPEC, does that uh, play a role or should we focus on uh, uh, hypoxic uh, abdominal perfusion like Carl just mentioned? What would be your suggestion? Because we have just uh, finished the interim analysis and uh, submitted a paper on peritoneal carcinomatosis in gastric cancer. Those who had extensive surgery, multiple chemotherapies, failed flood uh, approach, and we achieved with the upper abdominal perfusion and hypoxic abdominal perfusion a median sub overall survival of 17 months, even in those patients, having a Kanofsky of 60 and below. Well. I'll, I'll start with your, your last question and, and agree with you wholeheartedly that if, if with a high-grade malignancy, especially gastric cancer, I mean, I'm very humble when it comes to treating peritoneal metastases from gastric cancer. Um, to, 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 to extend uh, CRS and HIPEC, into patients uh, who have uh, uh, extensive uh, gastric malignancy uh, is does only helps the surgeon. It doesn't help the patient. Uh, and and I think that these uh, regional uh, perfusion. I, I don't do perfusion. I do infusion. But but what Carl Eigner has been working on for uh, uh, four decades, uh, that that would be the the direction in which to go on these patients who are not resectable. Um, can some of them perhaps profit from a lower abdominal uh, cytoreduction reduction and then focus uh, the area up in the upper abdomen uh, in and around the liver and, and stomach on a um, intra-arterial uh, perfusion? Uh, perhaps. But, but uh, um, um, I, uh, I didn't say anything about patient selection. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, the prognostic indicators and uh, uh, patient selection, I think is probably the most important aspect. As, as Brendan Moran says, the, the decisions are more important than the incisions. Uh, and he says that repeatedly, but, and, and, but it's true. And, and selection is, is uh, selection probably moved the, the, the peritoneal surface malignancy effort along more than anything else. Our results improved more from, from a knowledgeable patient selection than, than really from, from anything else. So I'm sorry I didn't, I didn't uh, talk about patient selection, but we'll have to do that on another day. Um, Thank you. Uh, and I, think, I think that answered your questions, I hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfectly fine. I was just uh, having uh, this issue, those who are not resectable, what, 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 is, your, what is your current take on that, on those patients? Well, you know, in the U.S., they all just get systemic chemotherapy, and they usually die from some chemotherapy complication, and now uh, they're all getting some for, form of immunotherapy, either on protocol or not, but uh, I certainly don't operate on them uh, as a peritoneal surface uh, surgeon. I, I think that uh, celiac uh, uh, infusions 
is is a very uh, is a wonderful way to uh, try and 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 get control of that disease, even if you can just slow it down for uh, a year or two years. Yes, I, did, I I don't know. Uh, Carl Eigner knows that some of the earliest work with with tritiated mitomycin C was done in my lab. We, we did a, a, a very uh, expensive uh, uh, experiment in pigs where we did uh, infusions into the uh, celiac uh, uh, vessels. And uh, we so, showed a, a, a times 10 step up of uh, uh, mitomycin C, the tritiated mitomycin C in tumors that were regionally perfused, intra-arterially regionally perfused as compared to systemic drugs, which is, was, uh, you know, that's, it's, that's a, uh, and then you can add stop flow onto that. Um, so yeah, there, there's, there's some real possibilities there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Edner, uh, the questions that I see being raised uh, broadly fall into two categories. One is uh, regarding the surgical techniques and the uh, post-operative complications, and the other is about high tech and ethics. So I think let us first take the questions regarding the uh, surgical aspects. There is a very interesting question. Uh, you use separate uh, teams for upper abdominal and lower abdominal surgery, and what about what about uh, taking breaks in between surgery? How important do you think it is for the surgeon who's going to stand and operate for 10, 12 hours to take a break in between? Okay, well, um, Ram, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen in, in, you know, in the next uh, generation of, of surgeons, but I, I did all the cases myself. Uh, either with myself or then a fellow might do, you know, the right diaphragm, or left diaphragm. But I, I basically took responsibility for both the upper and lower abdominal dissections. Dennis Chi, who I, I regard very highly at, at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, he's a gynecologic oncologist. He does the best he can in the uh, pelvis, and then he calls in... Uh, um, thoracic surgeon for the diaphragm and a patobiliary surgeon for around the liver. And I, I to tell you the truth, I, I, I don't like that. In the setting in which I operate, it's impossible. To get, to get three or four surgical subspecialties together into one operating room over a 10 hour time period is absolutely impossible. So I do the whole thing myself and I do take breaks. Uh, about every uh, five hours or so, and um, that, that's how. And, and uh, I always get a little bit of a break during the uh, during the high pack, but not too much because I'm I'm there manicuring. I like to manicure that small bowel, and and uh, that really works well with the open high pack. You can cut and cut and wash and cut and cut and wash and. The nurse is there picking away the specimens so nothing falls down into the uh, abdominal or pelvic space. So I do the whole thing myself, but I don't know what will happen in the future. Okay. I know at Basingstoke, they, they basically have they two surgeons. They, they, they have a, a surgical team approach. Uh, Dr. Hiba Saidi had uh, raised his hand. If he can unmute himself and... Uh, Switch on his video, he can put across his question directly to Dr. Subodaika. Dr. Hiva Saidi. Okay. Uh, next, uh, there is a question. Why do you use saline irrigation while uh, using your uh, high-cutting electropotry? And what are the settings of the electropotry document? So first, the, elect the, the cuttings on the electrocautery are um, if the nurses aren't watching and, and, and uh, the, the administrator, the, the, the head nurse in the OR is not there, I turn them all the way up. So on the uh, Valley Lab, that's uh, I think 220 on the cutting and 125 on the coag. It's as high, high as it will go. 
Is it a pure cut or a blended? It's pure, pure cut. Yes, a very good point. It's pure cut. If you use a blended cut, it, it just turns into a coagulum and you can't see what you're doing. So it's pure cut for going through the tissues. And then if you're really smart, you, you switch to coag and, and, and uh, uh, co coag bleeders before you, anything large before you go through them. So very hot electrosurgery. It's very hard on the electrosurgical generator. Uh, we, we would ruin about one every 18 months but they were under guarantee, so didn't matter. Um, what so, about using the saline irrigation? Why do you use the saline okay. irrigation? Okay, very, very good point. Whoever asked this question, it's a good question. So saline irrigation really augments the, the uh, power and, and the efficiency and the accuracy of the ball tip electrosurgical dissection. I mean, the, the saline is a conductor and, and uh, washing uh, all of the debris away, the, the, the uh, tissue debris, any little blood that's in the field, washing that away with saline will really allow you to, to perform a much more accurate uh, um, dissection, but it also uh, maximizes your, your speed at which you're able to, to you know, perform a a complete parietal peritoneectomy, which is not uncommon. I mean, I like to preserve peritoneum when I can, but um, uh, you, you can really move things along. You, you noticed that the, the, the operative field was quite wet. There was um, actually a fair amount of, fair amount of fluid uh, around uh, the peritoneal cavity. So I'm, I'm kind of a wet surgeon. We, we, we're irrigating every minute or two, um, and if you don't, you're going to build up too much heat, and then you're going to have damage to tubular structures. Yeah, okay. uh, Ramakrishnan, uh, he was saying he has uh, unmuted. Uh, uh, yeah, he could. He can ask this question directly. If you can uh, show your video also, that would be good. Doctor Hiva Saidi. Are you here, Dr. Hiva Saidi? He is there, but uh, he is not raising. Yes. Okay, I can. Okay, go. I'll I'll uh, proceed to the next question. Uh, how often have you had to do a total gastrectomy in case of a pseudo myxoma? And uh, would you ever think of combining that with a total colectomy as well? Very good question. So, um, almost exactly ten percent of the pseudo myxomas. Now that's over uh, 35 years, had a total or near total gastrectomy. That's a lot. Uh, Ram, it's not so much nowadays. The, the disease is, is changing uh, and, and people are referred earlier. I mean, I, I have sometimes now uh, a four hour cytoreductive surgical procedure rather than a 14 hour cytoreductive surgical procedure. But I did have a quite high incidence of uh, total gastrectomy and that's because the mass of disease uh, above the stomach and we lost the left gastric artery. And so we had to remove the uh, stomach. Uh, uh, we were able to preserve about two to three centimeters of the uh, stomach for our uh, uh, gastrojejunal anastomosis. But uh, uh, those patients do well. Um, they had a, a somewhat higher, but not prohibitively uh, higher complication rate. The problem was pancreatitis for the most part. And uh, uh, because we were stripping the uh, um, investing peritoneum off of the anterior uh, pancreas because there was disease there. And I think the intraperitoneal 5-FU, the EPIC 5-FU, <laughs> Uh, w was not good in that total gastrectomy uh, situation. <clears throat> so, would you consider uh, doing a total colectomy as well, Professor? You yes. Talk about so, that, uh, the it, results are that's what good. we call that's what we call the food tube operation, and and we've done uh, at least a dozen, uh, maybe more. I, I I haven't counted it up. I should go back and 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 see how many total 
colectomies and, and total gastrectomies that have been done. And they also have a, a very, if it's, uh, if it's a low grade, if it's a lamb, they have a, an excellent prognosis. Uh, of course, PCI doesn't really, doesn't have uh, much of an impact at all, a little bit, but doesn't really have an impact. So re you really just need to get it out. So we, we do have, uh, but I wouldn't recommend uh, doing a um, iliorectal anastomosis in those patients. We did some and, and it didn't work out very well. I think they need to have an ileostomy. When you do the total gastrectomy, they, they need to have a permanent ileostomy. They'll do, deal better with the permanent ileostomy than with the uh, iliorectal anastomosis. Dr. Sarad Deshai, as we see, can you ask your question directly? Yeah, for medical oncology. Dr. Sarah. Please go ahead, Dr. Sarah. If the use of uh, argon plasma coagulator. I uh, ha haven't used it. The, the, uh, the plasma, no, we, we, we basically use uh, electrosurgery. We sometimes uh, will we'll use uh, um, one of these spray uh, uh, electrosurgery on a diaphragm that's very bloody. But uh, I haven't used any sort of plasma type of uh, okay. mechanism to divide tissues. There's a question on the use of drains uh, post-operatively. Uh, Do you routinely use the drains? And uh, obviously, they are uh, likely to uh, produce cytotoxic effluent. So how, how would you uh, care for the uh, drains and the fluid that comes from it? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, uh, when, when you use the ball tip electrosurgical dissection, you're going to have hopefully no local recurrences, but you are going to have a, a larger amount of serous drainage. Uh, and you're gonna get some bothersome ascites. So I use five closed suction drains after every cytoreduction. reduction one beneath the right hemidiaphragm, one beneath the left hemidiaphragm, and then two down into the pelvis, and a fifth one right down the middle of the abdominal incision. And if there's been any trauma to the pancreas at all, there will be another one just at the lower edge of the uh, pancreas. And sometimes if, if the pancreas uh, has, has been dissected up, I'll go ahead and put that <clears throat> sixth closed suction drain in. They usually stay in, uh, the last one comes out at about a week uh, post-op. And um, it, it is a, uh, a burden on the nurses because they have to uh, uh, change those dressings in a sterile fashion uh, every three days. Uh, but um, our incidents, we, we if, if you ask me how, when did I have my last uh, uh, subphrenic or pelvic abscess, I, I can't tell you. Uh, you keeping those uh, closed suction drains there until most of the fluid disappears um, and keeping them occlusively uh, uh, and sterilely dressed does uh, d d really takes care of the, uh, the abscess problem. If I have intra-abdominal infection, it's, it's virtually always because I've got a fistula or a leak from the pancreas. Uh, pancreatic fistula is especially uh, uh, vexing. You don't have to reoperate, but the patients stay sick for a long time. I'm not quite sure why. Um, or it's a colorectal leak. We don't very often have a colorectal leak, but we have. Actually, I've never had a leak with the two-layer I have, to, I have to knock on wood uh, when I say that, but I've not had a leak from the uh, two-layer uh, uh, colorectal anastomosis. <clears throat> Done about 150 of them. So there was a question in the same uh, line regarding pancreatic fistulas. How common are they and how would you manage them? Yeah, they, they, uh, when we do the total gastrectomy, uh, I've forgotten the exact incidence, but it was like 20% with the total gas. Otherwise, you don't see a pancreatic fistula. Basically, well, you know, sometimes 
the tail of the pancreas is just totally engulfed by tumor. And you can either make the decision to try and dissect it away, or you can transect the uh, um, distal portion of the pancreas and, and, and take distal pancreas and spleen and undersurface of the left hemidiaphragm uh, together. Um, then you've got the potential problem of a leak from the, from the uh, transected pancreas. So usually a pancreatic fistula does not require reoperation. If it's drained, uh, it, it will eventually resolve, but the patients are in the hospital for a long time. It seems to be a, a very uh, a physiologically poorly accepted by the, uh, by the body, by the host, to have this pancreas juice uh, draining into the free peritoneal cavity. So all of those, I should probably uh, look up all of our patients who developed a post-operative pancreatitis. Uh, we've lost a couple of esophagojejunal anastomoses as a result of, uh, of pancreatitis. Um, that, that's been the biggest problem with the pancreatitis is the, is the esophagojejunal anastomosis, which is very, very close. All right. Uh, Dr. Sarud Desha has raised his hand again. Would you like to ask uh, any question? Uh, yeah, uh, Ramchanda, I just wanted to uh, know if the use of argon beam coagulator uh, or even spray coagulation would be better than touch coagulation, especially on the viscera. So um, yeah, I I think it, I I got so much equipment around the table as it is that I I, I rarely bring in the argon beam uh, electrocoagulator. The 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 uh, Valley Lab uh, on pure cut can basically take care of any bleeding on the liver that that you've got. I don't do this glistens capsulectomy. Uh, well, I do it, but I, I do it very slowly. And I, I, as I, as I um, peel away glistens capsule, I'm using the high voltage uh, pure cut electrosurgery to, to kind of uh, sear, to, 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 to cook that, that uh, uh, surface of the liver. So I, I don't get any, uh, I don't get any uh, bleeding. Uh, oh. I like to do, uh, you know, the five peritoneectomies and, and uh, three visceral resections without any blood loss, without any blood replacement. We almost always have fresh frozen plasma replacement um, my anesthesiologists, they love the fresh frozen plasma because it gives them volume, uh, but it also uh, replenishes the uh, coagulation factor. So our use of blood is minimal. Uh, if we have two units of blood with a side of reduction, that's unusual, but <clears throat> we can easily have 12, 12 bags of fresh frozen plasma. Uh, Soam, would you like to uh, share your experience with the use of APC? Yeah, uh, we, we use the APC extensively. Two places where I actually found its use is uh, the glisten capsulectomy, which Professor Sugarbaker told. That's one place. Second is when the whole mesentery on both sides is studied, uh, we normally use a varis needle at the root of mesentery to create a new below the mesentery. Then when we finish the finger dissection of the entire mesentery with bipolar scissor, uh, then you have this diffuse edge oozing and then if you try to use electrocautery, you may jeopardize those small vessels because you do the mesentric stripping with studded uh, mesothelioma or pseudomyxoma on both sides. Uh, the advantage of APC is uh, the penetration is not more than two millimeter. It can be used on the bowel ureter bladder without a injury. And the hemostasis is one of the best among uh, all the devices and the temperatures are also very low. Uh, so these are the two places I always use uh, APC and rest is all ballpoint pottery like what uh, Professor Sugar Baker told. These two off late we have found very useful with APC. So it's always there when I do a CRS IPEC. Yeah, no, I think, I think it, it, can, it can, definitely, uh, can definitely be used. When I was doing a, a lot of liver surgery, transecting liver, we, we uh, found the uh, uh, argon beam uh, uh, quite valuable. 
Um, and and I, I, yes, I, th I think it's a good tool. It's definitely a good tool. Mr. Sugarbaker, you said you would always uh, reinforce your uh, uh, colorectal anastomosis with the uh, second layer of sutures. Uh, would you consider doing the same if you had to uh, resect the part of the pancreas? Could you re put any reinforcing sutures on the pancreatic stump? Someone would like to know that. Yes, I, I do. <clears throat> I try and do the old fashioned fish, fish mouth closure of, of the uh, distal pancreas to, if possible, tie off the duct uh, it, you know, as a single uh, suture. But then, yes, try and fold the uh, pancreas over that duct and, and place uh, about five or six sutures. Uh, and don't pull them up too tight. Just just try, try and bring bring those uh, uh, peritoneal or bring bring those those uh, pancreatic surfaces just together over the duct, uh, without without too too much pressure. But I, I yes, I do try and close the distal pancreas with sutures. And uh, would you prefer doing your uh, bowel anastomosis before a hypo or uh, after hypo? Um. I am definitely a reconstruction post hypec. So, you know, I've done it both ways. I started out with closed technique. And uh, I've had to go back and re-excise colorectal anastomoses on about five patients. It's not an easy operation. And uh, so uh, recurrences at that low stapled anastomosis when we were using the closed technique was absolutely a reality. Now, I don't do this anymore. I used to do a gastrojujinostomy on these patients frequently uh, because we were so afraid of, of uh, uh, gastric stasis. But early on, we had a lot of patients with gastric stasis that went on for months. So we did a lot of, of uh, early on, we don't do it anymore. Early on, we did a lot of gastrojujinostomies. One out of 10 of those gastrojujinostomies got recurrence with the, uh, with the closed technique. And so on the basis of, of our literature report, we reported this in cancer, uh, uh, you know, recurrences after the closed methods we, we switched to always, and I can say, it's not always, there, there are some instances where we will do the anastomosis and then do the HIPEC, but it's very unusual. We will virtually always do the 10 liters of irrigation, one liter at a time and, and a very, very thorough, running the small bowel from top to bottom, uh, taking a last look at, the, the colon and making sure there's no omental appendages that are still involved by tumor and washing out uh, uh, beneath the stomach. Very common place to have recurrence is underneath the stomach. And I think it's just, <clears throat> just has not been, been uh, hasn't gotten, the chemotherapy hasn't gotten there and you forgot to wash. So it's very, very careful washing. And then open high pec with manual distribution uh, I, I don't. I think that the people who have said, "Oh, it's too dangerous," you you know, you're going to have all sorts of problems from uh, chemotherapy, aerosols poisoning the uh, OR environment. That's not true. Uh, it's very safe. The open uh, technique. Um, just don't splash. Splashing is bad. The droplet contamination is bad, but aerosol contamination is not a reality. So always high pec first and then anastomosis and abdominal closure. Okay. And yeah. Ram, I would say this, I feel so strongly about that, that in some of the clinical trials data that's been offered, I, I think that I just can't accept it because I think they have too many local recurrences uh, with the closed technique. Okay. So there was a question, how you prepare the 0.25% the hydrogen peroxide solution that you use to give a wash before I Oh, good, good question. We, we, did, we did a lot of work on this and it comes down to, you take three liters of warm saline and one bottle of 3% pre 
peroxide, you mix them together and you've got a 0.25% peroxide solution, which is very well tolerated by uh, the tissues. You can sometimes see little peroxide bubbles going up the uh, small vessels in, in the uh, colon, but uh, it, it's, uh, um, uh, it's, it's very well tolerated. And with that irrigation, we don't have any blood clots left behind in the field. Okay, so you, blood you clots use that mainly to remove the tumor. blood clots. What's that? The, the, we do that to remove all blood clots. Yes, 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 yeah. We don't want any blood clots left. Okay. Um, yeah, there was a question on what are the sites of recurrence uh, after a cyclorectal surgery in colorectal that you have come across, and is there a role for uh, resurgery in these sort of patients? Role for yeah, repeat surgery and colorectal malignancy is uh, usually palliative. Yeah, you you very often have to go back because you've got intestinal obstruction, or you've got a um, obstructed ureter, which is causing problems, or and you can't get a stent in, or, or, uh, but a curative uh, a reoperation for colon cancer is unusual. Does it never occur? I don't know. I think we had about a five percent salvage for appendiceal malignancy, whether it's it's a high grade or low grade. Uh, for appendiceal malignancy, totally different story. With uh, with lamb um, reoperations really don't interfere with long term survival. With with the peritoneal mucinous carcinoma, it does reduce it, but but uh, <laughs> if it's a lymph node negative uh, appendiceal malignancy, the results with reoperation are are extremely good, and I think that's why you need to follow these appendiceal malignancy patients really right out to 15 years. We've had um, a, a, a large number of recurrences of pseudomyxoma right on up to 20 years. It's, it's really amazing uh, now that we follow these people really long term, how long it can take for the disease to recur. Where does it recur? Over and above everywhere else, small bowel and small bowel mesentery. We, our ability to perform a soul satisfying visceral peritoneectomy uh, has not occurred. Maybe SP, we should be just uh, uh, flame throwing with your argon beam the entire uh, uh, visceral peritoneum. I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, in a non invasive tumor, you don't have involvement of. Of, of the little uh, lymphatic lacunae and the like uh, that can be on the, uh, on the uh, small bowel mesentery. But uh, the recurrences are virtually always on the small bowel. And um, I, I can't see them. I, I don't know why they're there. Um, high pec is not enough. As I said it many times, high pec is necessary but not sufficient. For uh, the higher grade malignancies, we need more. And we need uh, HIPEC combined with uh, celiac perfusion and stop flow. I don't know. Um, trial has never been done. Trial has never been done. Um, but, but, uh, um, well, go ahead. Next, next question. So, uh, most no, of no. your uh, live operating no, workshops, no. I have seen you removing the entire gastroepiploic arcade while doing an omentectomy. Yes. Uh, is it always necessary to remove the entire uh, arcade or can the arcade be preserved in some patients? I don't know whether it's necessary, but I always remove it. I, I know others, uh, very responsible uh, 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 groups uh, who have a, a lot of experience, they, they try to do the infracolic uh, uh, omentectomy. I don't ever do it. And I, as I tell you, I've gone back, this is for the most part on ovarian cancer patients. So the, the gynecologic oncologist, bless his heart, he, he's done the pelvic peritoneectomy and, and uh, 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 hysterectomy and, and, and rectal sigmoid colon resection. And, and then he does his infracolic omentectomy. And then I re-explore the patient and 
over by the spleen, it's, it's just solid tumor. And, and the, the whole uh, lesser curvature of the stomach, where, where there's this little residual amount of, uh, of, of momentum, it's just solid tumor. And, and we end up doing a sleeve gastrectomy uh, in order to uh, in order to get that uh, tumor out. So, uh, you know, I've seen that uh, too many times. And so for me, I, I, ju I just always do the total omentectomy right on over up into the hilum of the spleen. Of course, we'd like to preserve the spleen. We only preserve the spleen on about 7% of patients with pseudomyxoma. The spleen almost always goes. Dr. Dr. Vibra, you have... You want to ask a question, Dr. Rudra? Yeah, yeah, not a uh, question exactly, but uh, I think the tip what uh, Professor gave for the anterior resection to take extra sutures on the serogel, seromuscular sutures is very effective to avoid ileostomy. Uh, we have been doing this even in normal anterior resections, and uh, the best time to take these sutures is when the stapler is half open, it is not completely closed. So when it is half open, you can take the posterior sutures and enter sutures. And usually we take six sutures. And when, after you close it, then you can tighten the sutures and it works very nicely and you can avoid a ileostomy. I think it is a very nice technique. Ruja, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that suggestion. I have not done that but I can see that that might uh, facilitate a really nice, neat placement of, uh, of the, uh, of sutures. the uh, sutures. Yeah. I, I had a patient who, and I don't, I don't wanna uh, get myself in any trouble with Ethicon, but we use this, this new automated <coughs> Ethicon <coughs> stapler and it cut, it stapled, but it cut beautiful the patient actually passed out of his rectum pieces of the uh, staple line, but he, he didn't leak because we had this second layer of uh, sutures there that was nice and uh, and neatly placed. So exactly. that's that's a good suggestion. I'll ha yeah, I'll have to yeah. give that a try. And uh, another uh, technique we sometimes do is whenever the uh, resection is a little lower, I put a intraluminal. Uh, transcendental uh, rectal tube yes. so that it 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 uh, from the first day it has a at least there is no distension because of the uh, gas and uh, the passage of the flutters is very smooth and after 48 hours you can remove it so that i also put in some cases when the uh, anastomosis is a little lower I, I think that's a good, I, you know what I use? I, I very often do it also. I, I use a, a, a number 34 Malincott catheter. Correct. And, and I put it in and then suture it to the, uh, the thigh. And it'll yeah, I'll, I'll leave it in for, until the patient really begins to tell me, what's this thing coming out my rectum, uh, Dr. Sugarbaker? Can you please get rid of it? <laughs> and I always tell the family, I didn't forget it. Yeah. I, I left it in there purposefully. Yeah. But uh, when the patient really wakes up and, and gets off, uh, off their, uh, uh, begins to get in and out of bed, they, they notice that tube coming out there. And so it usually stays in for me for about five days. When I've done a Hartman closure, Rudra, when I've done a Hartman closure, I always leave that tube in because Correct. I've had Hartman's blow Definitely. out Definitely. Uh, on a couple of occasions. I think it's just too much gas that yeah. builds up uh, within, the, uh, within that rectal stump. Pouch. In the pouch. Yeah, pouch yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Baiju, uh, are we to continue? There's yeah, to... quite a lot of questions, uh, mostly now regarding HIPEC and EPIC. But I think the crux of Dr. Shubhadekar's talk today has been focused on the surgical techniques of uh, cytorectal surgery. And I think we have covered almost most of the questions regarding the surgical technique. There are a couple of questions regarding how you managed post-operative uh, complications, uh, especially bubble leaks, and uh, what is the fluid that you use for, uh, what is the perfusate you use during the HIPEC? Uh, yes, so for, for HIPEC, I've always used the 1.5% dextrose peritoneal dialysis solution. 
that's that's not that's not necessary. We've we've used it, and and I think the most important reason is that the nurses then will never give that infusion intravenously because it's in a peritoneal dialysis solution. Uh, a number of other places have had those liter bags of of chemotherapy given parenterally. Uh, but anyway, so but I think you can use saline or lactated ringers. Uh, I don't like to use uh, the five percent dextrose. We when when the oxaliplatinum, when the the uh, Elias Quick Chip, I think it's no, no longer recommended. But when the Quick Chip came in, uh, uh, Lana Bajelic used that on a few patients. She got some really bad problems, uh, uh, fluid and electrolyte problems early on when anesthesia wasn't wasn't aware of, of the fact that 5% dextrose had gone into the peritoneal space. We had terrible, terrible uh, hyponatremia. And uh, I know of one death actually that occurred as a result of uh, the hyponatremia. Um, but I, I think it really doesn't matter what the, um, what the carrier solution is for HIPEC. For EPIC, for EPIC, I'm convinced that a dextran solution is the best. And, and now for all of our long-term intraperitoneal chemos, we're starting to use intraperitoneal dextran. And, and there's a pharmacology behind that that's very supportive, but it also, uh, I think, uh, tends to minimize the amount of uh, adhesions that uh, will continue to form in the uh, abdomen and pelvis. Thank you. Dr. Baidu, it's your call. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, I have a question uh, regarding, not regarding to the hyper uh, surgery, regarding uh, a publication uh, you published in the uh, 1980s of uh, sugar procedure for uh, parastomal hernia. I was wondering whether it is the same uh, Paul Shukovaka or it's a different uh, Paul Shukovaka. <laughs> No, that's the same Paul Sugarbaker. <laughs> As a story it goes behind that, you know, when, when I went to the when I went to the National Institute of Health back in uh, oh in, uh, the seventies, I was the low guy on the totem pole, you know. And and who is it that becomes the person running the ostomy clinic? Well, they assigned me to run the ostomy clinic, and they had all these pelvic exenteration patients. And they had huge parastomal hernias. And most of them had been repaired two or three times using a, you know, a, a, a direct approach. And so I had, I had a whole, whole group of, of huge, I mean, some of these, these parastomal hernias were 20 centimeters in diameter. And we started putting on this uh, patch, this uh, uh, inverted pocket uh, repair so-called sugar baker repair now, I have to say it works spectacularly well. It works spectacularly well, yeah. I still, I still do it. I enjoy that operation. By the way, I do it open because it's so easy to do it open. It's such an easy case just to open the abdominal incision, tack this uh, uh, big piece of uh, Bardex dual mesh in there and, and you're done with it. You yeah. can tell that patient they're not gonna have a recurrence. Most of them have had two or three recurrences of their paraostomy hernia, but the the, the uh, pocket repair is, is really good. No, Don't it use the keyhole approach. You'll get you'll get too many stenoses uh, two or three or four years on down the line. Use the pocket repair. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays we use the laparoscopy for the same uh, repair. Yeah, uh, you're you're better than I am with that scope. I I uh, it, it's pretty complicated uh, with uh, scope repair. It's it's really easy with uh, with a uh, open repair. Uh, um, Professor Damakrishnan, you can go to uh, Professor Egner again again to the panelists to, for final comments, and we can wind up. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, uh, Professor Yogesh and uh, Professor Bad, uh, Egner, would you like to give any closing remarks? And please unmute yourself. Carl will have a Well, it was very informative, Paul. Nice to hear you again. Thank you. And uh, I think we later on we can talk about projects 
that we are planning uh, with the isolation perfusion in order to reduce the tumor masses and sometimes uh, thinking quite some cases make them resectable thereafter. Uh, it would be it would be a wonderful project, Carl. Absolutely, yeah. We can't. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, that uh, systemic chemotherapy to try and make patients resectable really doesn't work very well, uh, and and the combined intraperitoneal and systemic work a little bit better. But I would imagine intraarterial uh, would would be so much better than, than uh, the intravenous uh, chemotherapy. I think you could really uh, uh, downstage these malignancies uh, beautifully with, uh, with that approach. Absolutely. Uh, recently, we've been thinking about to reactivate our International Society Regional Cancer Treatment in order to mobilize some of those old guys. Some died already, you know. We are still here, Paul. <laughs> and maybe we should make uh, a new group. Um, yeah. You, my new you know, Carl, yeah. He's very Carl, you, you, you in some respects are, are uh, a co founder of, of uh, uh, peritoneal surface malignancy because, you know, we were really struggling way back then. You know, a lot of people said, oh, you're, you're crazy. Uh, these big operations, this chemotherapy washing was a lot of resistance. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I had to submit papers, sometimes three or four times, because I said, oh, this is this guy's wasting his time. But that that uh, International Society of Regional Cancer Treatment, uh, I think, gave us a boost. It, it gave us a boost way back then at the beginning, which was uh, which was really greatly appreciated, greatly appreciated. Okay. Yeah. So we will in a short uh, reactivate, uh, reactivate this group and we will be very delighted to have you. Of course, you are the, uh, uh, along with Carl, you are most, uh, one of the most senior executive members of this society. And uh, we hope to have your contribution for this. Well, I'll do my best. I'll do my best, yeah. And also on this platform, everyone else who is interested Mostly welcome, uh, Professor Belju has my contact details. Uh, he can pass them to anyone who is interested and get back to us. Sure, sure. We could bring some studies on the way, which are very interesting, at least. Thank you, uh, Professor Egner. Uh, Soam and Dr. Ganesh, uh, any final comments, please? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's it, it's very less to say because it's an excellent presentation, uh, so uh, uh, informative to everyone. And uh, thank you, Professor uh, Sugar Baker, for that wonderful talk. And uh, I think we should really commend uh, Sena Deepan Foundation for this initiative. That's from me. Thank you, sir. Thank I'm, you. I'm really very very happy to be a part of it, Ganesh. Very happy to be a part of it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You know, what is the beauty of this last two hours interaction? Uh, Professor Paul Sugarbaker has wealth of knowledge in HIPEC. And I'm happy he didn't concentrate on uh, HIPEC, but the cytorepti surgery, which is the, the three to four decades of experience. And, you know, HIPEC theory part, we can always read back from a lot of books. But the practical tips from him personally is something which is very good. This is a really wow thing. You know, most of the orations talk I hear half of the time is in the high peg. But I'm very happy today it was most practical and uh, thank you Baiju for you know, organizing this and I wish this could go on and on and I know in India it's already getting night. But uh, I'm sure if we continue interaction, we'll see you tomorrow morning here. Uh, thank you <laughs> very much. Okay, thank you so much. Uh... SP, could I just say something? You know, when, when I was to come to your meeting yes. in March of 2020, I ordered up 50 copies of the SOGI textbook yes. uh, of uh, cytoreductive surgery and uh, perioperative chemotherapy. I still have those 50 textbooks. If Super. you and I ought to talk about how to uh, arrange those, maybe we could ship them to uh, one of the commercial groups yes. and they could distribute them uh, 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 in India to, to those people who are interested because discussing HIPEC, for example, here, and because we got HIPEC for gastric and, and colon and 
appendix and, and ovarian and then uh, reoperate. It's just too complex. And, and it, but uh, we, we could, we could, uh, I could ship those books to a, a single site and then, and then maybe, maybe uh, you are, are uh, one of the people who you used for HIPEC for you could, could distribute them to uh, the interested people. Well, maybe we can, we can correspond about that. Absolutely, absolutely. I would be more than happy to take that. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if there were a lot of questions that remained unanswered, but uh, we had nearly 400 participants uh, who were sitting almost right through till the end. And Congratulations to you. That's wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, so it was uh, quite impossible to answer all the questions, but I think uh, as Professor Sugarbaker pointed out, the crux of uh, treatment is the uh, surgical part. And uh, I think yes. we've been able to cover most of the questions related to the surgery. You know, many yes. of the others were Good. related to HIPEC, uh, which probably uh, if uh, they are interested, they could probably mail you directly and uh, respond with you, Dr. Sugarbaker. Yeah, I, I probably won't know the answer to the question though. <laughs> because the, because the the high pack issue is 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 you know we're, 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 there's a lot to be learned uh, about high pack and epic and nipec and we we really we really have not clearly defined that as yet and and as uh, uh, th there is an effort to to have what one of these uh, 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 Delphi uh, consensus uh, meet, uh, meetings. How 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 much that will how far that will go to clarifying the best or the optimal high pack? I'm not quite sure. I think we need more research. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Now I take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, Professor Sugarbaker for accepting my invitation to present uh, uh, an amazing videos and. Uh, uh, and a wonderful talk, and it was really uh, uh, touching. And uh, we could learn a lot of uh, tips and tricks from, from your presentation. And Zainadabin uh, uh, Education um, Foundation is intent up to you uh, for this uh, wonderful talk. Also, I uh, thank Dr. Uh, Ramakrishnan for accepting my invitation to moderate the session. You did it very well. And also, Professor uh, Carl Yagner, uh, Yogesh, uh, Dr. Swamashekar, Dr. Ganesh Sandhukumar, and finally, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bhavana Parekh for introducing the moderator and, uh, and the speaker. And all the participants, are, there are logins from more than 60 countries uh, today. So, uh, wow. All the who have uh, participated from the- Again, congratulations to you on that. That's wonderful. That's quite yeah. an outreach. Yes. Thank you, thank you. And your final words, uh, uh, Professor. Well, I don't think I have any final words. I wish we could get together uh, you know, there's been some nice feedback uh, it, from from this particular uh, presentation, but uh, uh, I'm I'm really uh, yearning for the time when I can uh, get back to India, or whether we can get you all over to uh, Venice, and uh, we can uh, um, uh, combine uh, these uh, so um, these important uh, professional interactions with some some good uh, social uh, uh, interactions. I'm I'm looking forward to that. Thank you all once again, and uh, uh, can we wind up? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, so uh, I would once again like to thank uh, Professor Sugarbaker and all the panelists uh, who have taken part in this uh, program, and to all the participants uh, who have flooded us with uh, their uh, inquisitive questions. Uh, so uh, I, I don't uh, wish to add any more to the words of wisdom, the pearls of wisdom that uh, have been uh, expressed here by Dr. Sugarbaker and the other panelists. Uh, thank you, Baiju, once again for organizing such a wonderful program with a very wide international outreach. And we hope to see more of such uh, programs from the Sena Foundation. Sure, sure. Thank, thank you. So thank you so I look forward to it. Thank you. OK, thanks, thank everybody, you. so much. It was a great thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Yeah. Can I end the meeting? Yes. Thank you. Hi to everybody. Thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.